So a little bit about Local Food College and me. I'm Greg Swazer. I work with the Regional Sustainable Development Partnerships. We're a host of Local Food College. Local Food College has been, we've been doing this for eight years, this Local Food College thing. And it's a program with the University of Minnesota Extension's Regional Sustainable Development Partnerships, as well as Extension collaborators across the great state of Minnesota. We do this every Tuesday for five weeks. We have another program with different topics. Um, today's topics will be about all about eating bugs. Last week was about uh, pastured pork, I believe, and next week will be about uh, the emerging hazelnut industry, so check back in if you're interested. Um, we do this in this format here so that people can watch it at home. You can watch it live from your own living room, or you can get together. Initially, we used to do this where people would get together in a classroom and watch this, uh, this program, the programming in a classroom with other folks. And you can also go back in the future and watch these things as we have them recorded up on the Local Food College website. Local Food College supports farmers, and local food systems, and gardeners who produce their own food. And we use this format because it allows us to reach a wide, geograph uh, a wide geography efficiently. And we can reach people far and wide throughout Minnesota and beyond. And that helps people connect with us who might not be able to do things like go to conferences or, or events that have to travel long distance. Next here, so tonight's plan, here's what we're gonna do. Um, ask questions in the chat box. Uh, right now, as I mentioned, you and all of your dogs are muted, so you'll have to use the chat box to communicate with us. These sessions will be recorded and posted to the Local Foods College website, so please also have patience with us in this technology. We are using Zoom which is a new program for us. It's our first year using Zoom. Um, so uh, if things start to go a little bit haywire, just uh, hang in there, we'll get it all figured out. It works pretty well so far, so I think we'll be okay. Afterwards, you will be emailed a link to evaluate the session. So please, please, please uh, use the email link and tell us what you thought about this session. And this session uh, will last about one hour. So it's 6.04 right now. We plan to be done by seven. Uh, there's a chance maybe we'll go a little bit afterwards, but we'll try not to do that. So we'll be here for an hour for you. So um, I will introduce with you to you, Bruno Borsari. And he will lead the session, Bugs with Bruno. We're all excited for Bruno. Bruno Borsari is a native Italian and professor emeritus of biology at Winona State University. He has 27 years of experience in habitat restoration and sustainable agriculture. He earned his doctoral of Agri Doctor of Agricultural Science degree from the University of Bologna in Italy in 1986 and his PhD from the University of New Orleans in 2001. He has taught and practiced ecological farming, agroforestry, and habitat prairie restoration in various countries, mainly West and Central Africa, and has consulted Italian farmers to transition from conventional agriculture to integrated pest management and assisted them to pursue organic certification for their farms. In the U.S., Dr. Borsari served in the Board of Louisiana Organic Association, was president of the Cajun Prairie Restoration Society, and was part of the Southern Sustainable Agriculture Working Group. Prior to his relocation to sunny, cold Winona in 2005, he was an assistant professor of agroecology at Slippery Rock University in Pennsylvania and an active member of the Pennsylvania Association for Sustainable Agriculture. He maintains a membership with the Land Institute in Salina, Kansas, and the Rodale Institute in Kutztown, Pennsylvania. His publications record uh, his his publications record, record demonstrates his ability for his research and interest in prairie restoration ecology, biology, science, education, sustainability, agricultural education reform, and local foods. Thank you, Greg. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. Uh, yes, Gene has already made a remark. I was a, a speaker at the annual meeting of the Minnesota Native Plant Society last last year very good yeah prairies i am very happy to be a a, a new addition to the upper midwest uh, <laughs> prairie enthusiast but tonight we're going to talk about bugs is a tuesday bug tuesdays with bruno and so uh, we are going to see how these critters can be introduced well 
they have been already introduced for thousands of years in many cultures, but they are quickly becoming quite popular also in our Western uh, culture. So the topic tonight is trying to make persuasive the case that a diet that includes also insects is contributing to a sustainable development, perhaps. I'm, I'm very positive about that. Um, the versatility of insects is something that is uh, getting a lot of attraction in this idea of urban agriculture. So that is why I have I have a building in the beginning of my slide that is showing uh, this new architectural idea of the skyscraper like a, like a forest tree. And so where you have green, where you have plants, you can also have a lot of invertebrates. And among these, insects rule. And so let me see how now I can move forward. I cannot... Uh, I cannot move to the next slide, though, Greg. Sorry, I was muted. Uh, Anna, do you have any way to help us do that? If you just uh, click your, it your should cursor. Be, I, sh I think it should be up in, kind of in the upper corner. You should have some arrows. Upper corners. Let's see. Oh, there we go. Is in the bottom left corner. The bottom left. Okay, I knew it was in one of those corners. <laughs> okay, thank you. All right, so the story goes on. In this slide, you can see how I'm going to structure this hour presentation. So give you a little overview of what is entomophagy and why we eat insects. But more than that, I want to share with all of you my personal experience of eating bugs because during my younger age, I served as a volunteer, the equivalent of a Peace Corps in Africa, mainly in uh, Sierra Leone, West Africa, and in the Central African Republic. And that, my friends, is where millions of people consume, have been consuming insects throughout the seasons for thousands of years. But like I said, entomophagy becomes an interesting concept also for uh, developing agriculture in urban settings where space is, uh, is unavailable or where, you know, insects uh, can be raised because of their extremely small size. And then I want to touch briefly to some selected insect species that I have experienced growing because I've been a, a, a professor in biology, I saw in, in the biology department, we raise insects mainly to feed uh, vertebrates, and then what is needed to grow these insects. And then to conclude, you know, some uh, more pragmatic issues like cost, possible market niches, and then uh, education and different kinds of food, or pro uh, food products that are already available on the market. So here we go. What is entomophagy? The, the, the raw definition is, as you can read, the use of eating insects, especially by people, and I can tell you that in the world, uh, the FAO is estimating that about 2 billion people, mainly in Africa and in Asia, especially Southeast Asia, from uh, Thailand, Cambodia, Southeast China, Vietnam, have been consuming insects for a very long time. In this picture, I'm showing the life cycle of two uh, the, uh, generalized insects. On the left hand side, that could be a cricket or a grasshopper. And on the right side, you could see uh, the life cycle of a moth or a butterfly. Why these two? Because uh, these are two representative taxa, so groups of bugs that are most consumed in the world. And why these cycles are significant to me? Because, as you can see from the arrows, the arrows uh, about the cricket, for example, are, are pointing at the adult and are pointing at the egg. These are the products. So, for thousands of years in many regions of Africa and Asia, uh, people have been harvesting, you know, the swarming locusts 
and the, the, they have been known without knowing that formally, but uh, some clues, some ideas of their reproduction, their biological cycle, and the products, uh, either the egg or the mature adult, are normally, when you talk about orthopterans, crickets and grasshoppers, the, the, the prize that you get from this group of insects. It is interesting now if we focus on the, on the cycle of the moth that uh, unlike the cricket, the moth, like many other insects, for example, the coleoptera, you know, the beetles, undergo through a complete anatomical change of its body from the hatching of the egg to the full development of the adult. As you can read from the slide, this process is called metamorphosis, okay? It is fascinating to me because in order to acquire all the energy from the food that the larva will consume, that little bug or caterpillar will have to increase his body weight sometimes hundreds of times, okay? And so, <laughs> Since the molecules that make the body of living beings in the animal kingdom are either carbohydrates, proteins, or fats, okay, uh, these caterpillars, I can tell you because I ate them in Africa, are extremely succulent, okay? Uh, and so on the left side, the, 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 the cycle of the cricket instead is a little different. The cycle of the cricket, crickets do not undergo a metamorphosis. As you can see, the juvenile is called, is not called larva, but nymph. The nymph already resembles completely the adult, okay? So this is a little biological difference that I wanted to point out. Uh, also to uh, stress on which part of the life cycle is uh, interesting by these gatherers, okay? that in many uh, tropical countries for thousands of years, like I said, have been very attentive to these cycles and to take advantage of, of these kind of foods. Okay, why eating insects? Well, my background is agriculture. So I can tell you for what I've been experiencing most of my life, uh, the, 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 the paradigm of industrial agriculture is extractive. So all the corn, all the meat, all the eggs, all the food that we produce from our farms basically is the outcome of uh, relatively still cheap oil. But oil is an all renewable resource. So I'm sure you may be familiar with those great film documentaries like Food Inc, where basically you are educated on the fact that in industrial agriculture is not the plant any longer through the a process of photosynthesis, converting CO2 into glucose for us to consume, but rather is oil. So oil that is a non-renewable resource. So this information here on, on, on the slide is a summary that I found from a document by the Union of Concerned Scientists of 2019 that point out, you know, the environmental costs. This kind of extractive agriculture is mining soil, is causing erosion, is basically homogenizing landscape and causing massive loss of biodiversity. But also there are health costs involved in this idea of industrial agriculture. We all know since Rachel Carson wrote Silent Spring in 1962, right, for which President Kennedy finally banned DDT from, uh, from uh, the insecticide DDT from uh, uh, our food production system. But still, we have billions of pounds of herbicides, insecticides, nematicides, fungicides that are used on our land. And these are causing water pollution. They are causing problems with residues in the food that we eat. They are uh, causing a, a cascading effect of, 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 of uh, health uh, hazards that eventually have a dollar value, you know, on rural communities, but also in urban communities uh, because of this relatively cheap way of industrial agriculture that we have developed. And finally, social costs, the loss of family farms and the economic damage that goes with it.
with family farms that becomes engulfed by big corporations for the continuation of this uh, uh, crazy, in my opinion, system of, uh, of, of exploiting the land, monocultures. So why eating insects? Well, eating insects uh, is becoming clear to entomologists, but now also to many more of us among the general public, uh, they have a very high feed conversion efficiency. Just to give you an idea, you know, a cricket, like the one I showed you in the picture, okay, uh, can produce basically a kilogram of its body weight raised in a box with thousands of other crickets by converting simply two kilograms of feed, all right? You will need for that same uh, production, let's say of beef, 10 kilograms at least for a steer to produce one kilogram of meat. And so uh, the same for also all the other livestock, including our little lovely chickens that are the most uh, uh, environmentally effective, efficient in converting feed into muscle tissue or into eggs. But also the other big thing about eating insects is that they can be reared on organic substrates. So think about uh, flies. There are thousands of uh, species of flies, okay? These bugs actually can uh, environmentally be beneficial by converting sludges or biological waste, you know, normally manures, fresh manures from farms into something that uh, can be more valuable, like for example, compost or semi-composted material. And at the same time, their larvae can be employed either for animal feed, but also potentially like crickets and like uh, caterpillars could become employed for human feed. On this token of the feed conversion, also the emission of greenhouse gases like CO2, methane, uh, uh, nitrogen in the form of uh, ammonia, you know, a little insects produces an insignificant amount compared to a large cow, a horse, a pig. Just to give you an idea, you can find online all this information very well, very, very well described from reputable sources. And water, water is becoming the major limiting resource for agriculture and for human livelihood worldwide. Uh, so there are gallons of water that a cow will require to produce one liter of one gallon of milk or one kilogram of uh, muscle tissue. Well, our insects are much more tolerant to dehydration. They do not need as much water at all. And so these are all great benefits that make this large group of invertebrates uh, some uh, <laughs> some uh, um, specialists, you know, in food or agriculturalist entomologists begin to understand how uh, the development of, of an industry in which insects are employable as food can definitely uh, have very, very many benefits. And then they pose a limited risk on transmitting zoonotic diseases. One could think, oh, it's dirty to eat Insects, because insects, imagine flies, you know, they can transmit diseases that can be transmissible to us. Well, that is a possibility, but biologists indicate that we humans as vertebrates are evolutionarily divided more than 300 million years from this group of arthropods that we call insects. So, although the concerns remain, most authors that I found in the literature will indicate that it is rare uh, that uh, zoonotic diseases may be transmissible to humans. Perhaps allergies, therefore they are inviting uh, veterinarians, they are inviting food scientists to continue to study the possibility for allergies by consuming certain kind of, of body parts like the chitinous exoskeleton, for example, of the grasshopper. But uh, from the literature, I really didn't find any case uh, that may be uh, worthy of any kind of significance. Look at this slide. I add space just to 
show images of the most representative taxa groups of, uh, of insects. But uh, uh, the literature is showing that there are 1,900 species of edible bugs. And so among them, I have mentioned, you know, the grasshoppers. Grasshoppers that, uh, for example, from our neighbors, the Me Mexicans, especially in southern Mexico, I don't know if you've ever heard about chapulines. These are dehydrated grasshoppers. I have seen videos where, you know, the, the, in, in Oaxaca and Tabasco states, southern Mexico, you can purchase food, uh, street food, like tacos with chapulines, okay? But also at the bottom of the slide, another major taxon of insects are are hymenopterans. So in this group, we find bugs like termites, like bees, like ants. And don't get me wrong, I mean, we have also in the Northern Hemisphere a very long tradition of raising bees, okay? But in many developing countries, okay, uh, the bees that primarily still live in the, in the wild uh, are really a, a luxury food for native people that like the bear in, uh, in Minnesota, you know, will consume everything, the larvae with the pollen and with the honey and with the wax, the same humans will do, uh, especially in Africa, if they find colonies of feral bees. Termites, in the United States alone, I don't know how many billions of dollars we, we, we spend every year to exterminate termites. But termites in Africa, I have consumed them on several occasions, are a luxury food. I'm not talking about famine food, emergency food. I'm talking about foods that in the culture of the people of Central Africa, of the people of the Congo, appear every year at the beginning of the rainy season. And it's a feast. I lived in Bangui, Central Africa for almost a year, and I never forget all the excitement in the neighborhood where I live because the capital city had electricity. And I remember by the thousands, all these flying termites, you know, banging against the mosquito nets of the window of the little house where I live, and then kids outside collecting and begging all these insects that were for sale then fresh the next day on the market down the street. Uh, beetles, I mentioned beetles already. Well, beetles, um, constitute like the 31% I was reading of all the possible insects that are edible, okay? Uh, the caterpillars, as you see at the top of the slide, that is a mopane uh, caterpillar on the left side and uh, the, the white colored, creamy colored one, instead is the bamboo caterpillar from Southeast Asia they constitute about the 18% of all insects consumed. Okay, so this image now to go back to what I just mentioned, you know, the advantage of raising insects because of their uh, very high efficiency in converting feed into edible parts, into growth, okay? Uh, that table, okay, from that, Researcher Van Huys, uh, he's a Dutch. Holland in Europe is really leading the pack for uh, finding a way and convincing the countries of the European Union to expand the opportunities with, with raising insects. And so from this scientist and his collaborators, you can see from the table that if we're looking at one kilogram of meat, okay, we'll take about 10 kilograms of feed for the cow, and 15,000, more than 15,000 liters, okay? Same kind of amount of feed for producing uh, lamb chops, a little bit less of water, but still we're talking about enormous amount of resources needed to produce meat. Look at the pig, you know, four kilograms of feed for one kilogram of meat and almost 6,000 liters. And even the chicken, that is the most efficient among our farm animals, we're talking about a lot of water too. But if you look at the cricket, okay, 
per every kilogram of crickets, you just need a couple of kilograms of feed and about five liters of water. Okay, so in this slide, you see the three uh, keystone uh, stages of the typical biological cycle for any insect. So we talked about the eggs because eggs are consumed. Again, in Southern Mexico, I forgot the name of the, um, of the ant. Uh, well, it's written in the, in the slide, Liometopum apiculatum, what the Southern Mexicans call escamoles, okay? These are uh, uh, relatively large eggs that these species of ants are producing and so really, the women and children, because in, in uh, rural areas, women and, ch and children are, are scouting the environment and gathering these foods, uh, know very well where to find and at what time of the year the escamoles will be most available. But then either the larval, larva stage or the adult stage like I was showing you previously in the cycle of the cricket and the caterpillar are typically stages of uh, market, marketability of, uh, of uh, food that can be obtained from insects. Okay, then of course the concern or the interest could be, well, how do insects compare with the uh, nutrition. So from that table that you see on the slide, you can have an idea that if we look at the major groups of, uh, of nutrients, the proteins, the lipids or fats, among them the saturated fats and the omega-3 fatty acids that are so important in our diet because they produce the myelin and, and, and protect our nervous system from deleterious uh, chronic diseases, you know, like, like Alzheimer or uh, others, you know. And then the fiber, you can see that, uh, for example, crickets and mealworms are really standing out. Look at proteins, for example, crickets, 31 grams versus, for example, 20.4 or 19.2 in salmon or whole egg, 22.4 in beef or 24.6 in the tofu, and the same for fat. So these are the big two categories of macronutrients that came to my mind. Then if you are protective of your cardiovascular system and you are attentive in your diet not to consume too much uh, animal products because they have typically saturated fats. Look at the amount of saturated fat in uh, crickets and mealworm. Okay, in crickets is quite low. Mealworm is comparable to whole egg, especially the yolk or beef. So if you have problems with high blood pressure, if you have problems with bad cholesterol, choose crickets rather than mealworm. That's what I would say. Go to Oaxaca and eat all the chapulines tacos you can have. You shouldn't have any bad health problems for your heart and blood vessels. So as the use of insects is being uh, evaluated, is being scrutinized, there are entrepreneurs that would like to facilitate this process. Like I said, Holland has already an Insects Producers Association. So Holland is already producing different marketable um, insect foods that consumers find on the shelves of their stores. In, French, in France is the same. But I can tell you being Italian myself, you know, Southern Europe moves always a little bit at a slower pace with these new kind of innovations. But I can tell you that, for example, even when I was a kid, even though snails are not insects, but in Italy we ate snails. In Italy we eat earthworms, okay? It's not very common, 
okay? In northeastern Italy, there is a, a, a moth caterpillar that during the summertime is available and has been consumed by mountain people. I'm talking about northeastern Italy, close to the border with the, with the former Yugoslavia, you know, in the Carnia region. That is a, a, another great resource, you know, that like in Africa, like in Southeast Asia, appears. There is a season that happens at a certain time of the year. But uh, here on this slide, you see my funnel. You know, there is a thriving feed for livestock and aquaculture uh, industry that has been using insects for a while. Especially among livestock, I'm talking about avian species. Whales, chickens, egg, egg layers, you know, turkeys, uh, but also fish, aquaculture, you know. And insect species, as you see from uh, the, the left side, are uh, particularly uh, flies. So black soldier fly, common house fly. These are insects, like I said, that grow on, uh, on uh, waste products that is common on a farm, like manures, all right? But we find again our mealworm. So that mealworm that is a, a very common beetle that you can grow in your bedroom if you want with at minimum cost. Is, has also been used for quite some time by the. Hey, hey Bruno, I'm gonna, I've got to jump in and interrupt you because you'll go on and on. I got a question for you. Are you ready? All sure. right. Um, does the use of herbicides and pesticides affect the safe consumption of our insects? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. The model I mentioned earlier of industrial agriculture is having a catastrophe on the uh, insect world. And that is also, you know, <laughs> what has been going on for, for a very long time. Uh, the the uh, agro industry, uh, almost 30 years ago, when they began to develop genetically modified crops like uh, Bacillus thuringiensis, Bt corn, herbicide resistance, cotton or soybean or canola, they promised uh, farmers that this would have been the agriculture of the future, the cleaner type of agriculture, because by employing GMOs, we would have not had to use as many pesticides. But if you look at the statistics, uh, we are consuming, you know, the, 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 the cost of agrochemicals goes higher and higher every year, also because the seed that were genetically modified 30 years ago, are slowly losing their power of uh, resistance to mutating insects. So the, the, the struggle against insect as pests goes on. And that doesn't make absolutely any sense because insects in the phylum Arthropoda are a major class. Imagine there are about, uh, biologists are estimating about, uh, Eight, 10 million species in the animal kingdom. Well, there are something like 1.5 million are insects. Of these 1.5 million, however, entomologists have been telling us that about 5,000 are noxious to cultivated crops. But by developing insecticides, we have created a technology that allows the farmers to grow in the field, spray that insecticides, and kill everything. So the bad bugs, but also the pollinators, the, the insects like the ladybugs that would, and many others that would exert biological control. So it's a nicotine every time that we use an insecticide. So definitely, as this kind of food resource is dwindling in the poor uh, developing countries, uh, intensive industrial agriculture with monoculture has been affecting the economy and the food security in African countries, in Southeastern countries, because of this model of, of industrial agriculture. So absolutely, agrichemicals are a big pain for the uh, livelihood of uh, life in general and insects in particular.
I hope this answers my question. Yeah, and I think maybe the uh, to follow up, you're you're encouraging people to um, grow their own insects, harvest their own. So in that sense, you're not harvesting wild insects that may have been uh, flying around on. And in fact, and in fact, I think that uh, as worldwide also it is happening, this idea of urban agriculture is getting traction both in Western countries but also in the big metropolitan areas of Africa, of South America, of Southeast Asia. And definitely there are great opportunities to create a micro economy that generates maybe a currency that circulates within the same community and can ensure also the quality of the product. Because for example, I was reading in Nigeria, okay, Nigeria is a country that the, the, the size more or less of Texas, but has the same population. If I tell my students, we are comparable as a population to the population of Nigeria. Now imagine all Americans from Fairbanks, Alaska to Fort Lauderdale, Florida, moving to Texas. Imagine what kind of different life you would have. And so because of the use and abuse of pesticides in Nigeria as well, even in the villages, you know, now I was reading and learning that uh, uh, women and children are forbidden by their elderly to go and harvest insects because they are afraid of toxicity. They are afraid of disease caused by the heavy residues that are still applied by big companies that grow monocultures of uh, industrial crops over there as well. So moving on here, you know, we may still remain surprised, but I'm thinking, why all the fuss? Okay, if you have never read Guns, Germs, and Steel by Pierre Diamond, I strongly encourage you to do so. It's a great book that intermingles, you know, mixes a lot of biogeography with biology, conservation, civilization, and the demise of civilization. But to make a long story short, our Western culture developed in the, in the, in the valley of uh, the Crescent Valley, what is nowadays, you know, Southwestern Turkey, Syria, the Middle East, in other words. That is where agriculture developed and that, and that was transferred by our ancestors slowly into Europe. Then Europeans came to America, but because 10,000 years ago, in the Crescent Valley, humans began to domesticate the first animals, they began to domesticate the, the, the first plants and protect these plants from other critters, including insects. Chances are that we developed that culture of, oh, insects are a no-no. Although it is interesting to learn that the biblical manna that the Israelites consumed as they were going across the desert to flee from the Egyptian uh, slavery is actually the sugary uh, waste product produced by scale insects. And so documents exist, you know, evidence suggests that our ancestors from the Middle East also uh, at one time must have been heavy consumers of insects. But that kind of culture eventually was subsided by the development of agriculture with crops and domesticated animals. And that kind of culture was transferred eventually by the Europeans when they moved to the Americas. But if you look at, this, at, the, at the slide, you know, uh, many different kinds of foods that we call seafood, lobster, shrimps, prawns, crayfish, crabs, are all cousins of our insects. They belong to the class Crustacea, but nonetheless, they have a lot of, of uh, similarities and uh, they are evolutionary linked to, to um, insects. Okay, so what kind of products may we get from insects? Uh, in the North, Hemisphere, we know them primarily as foes of our agricultural effort. But uh, did you know, for example, that from uh, scale insects like this Dactylopius caucus, uh, 
in South America, countries like Ecuador, Peru, Bolivia, they produce this carmine or cochineal that is giving a rosé kind of color to different kinds of foods, including that Starbucks coffee frappuccino. And then I put in the, in the table the date 2012, because apparently in the US, the vegan community, when they learn, somebody learned in the vegan community about frappuccino uh, using a, 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 an insect product, when they, then they raised the flag and they made a big fuss, and I think Starbucks now has changed its policy and is not using cochineo anymore. However, the Italian drink Campari is an aperitif, you know, the color, rosé, I remember it very well, comes from this product. And so, uh, despite the fact that Starbucks doesn't use this product anymore, the United States still remains, together with Germany and Brazil, a big importer from South America of this uh, carmine or cochineal. Then I mentioned already LERP. So this is a sugary secretion produced by larvae of this psyllid bug, okay? So the psyllid bug is like, uh, is a relative of the stink bug. If you're familiar with the stink bug in our gardens, okay? Uh, you may be familiar perhaps with the silkworm. Uh, the silk has been produced in uh, Asia for thousands of years. But did you know, for example, that in India, silkworms are consumed, not only the larvae, but also the cocoon before they are uh, for completely dried. In Korea, the powder from the same cocoon is used to make a natural medicine to treat diabetes. And then uh, we all know about the honeybees for their, for their honey, for their wax, for their propolis, for their pollination services. But did you know, for example, that in Southeastern uh, Europe, Greece and Turkey, uh, beekeepers have been introducing purposely this scale insect called Marcalina hellenica. This bug lives uh, on uh, pine, on the pine species, of Southeast Europe. And so the beekeepers enjoy the fact that the scale produces like a honeydew. So it's basically excrement, right? That is sugary and that the bees voraciously bring back to the hive so that uh, bee producers can, 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 can market, you know, their pine, uh, pine honey. And then there are also edible oils like from Africa, from this melon bug okay, that lives in Sudan, in the region of uh, Kordofan and Darfur, so Africa, a very dry region of Southern Sudan. So many, many different uh, kind of uh, uses insects have, not only as, as food. Now, my personal experience with all of this, this is a picture of myself with the first class I've ever taught in Lunsar, Sierra Leone, West Africa. That is where I lived in the mid 1980s. And there I had seasonally, together with my students, you know, grasshoppers, I had that Mopane uh, caterpillar I was showing you in a previous slide, and termites every year at the onset of the rainy season. I, it, I find it interesting, you know, because because meat in Africa is, is more a luxury than anything else, because you do not have refrigeration systems or anything else. And so uh, it was funny because my students were always calling beef, beef. We were working in the farm, digging out potatoes. Sometimes grasshoppers were hopping. They were catching them. They were removing their legs and putting them in their pockets. Beef, anything belonging to the animal kingdom is beef. Over there, I ate snake, I ate insects, I had different kinds of beef, and I always smile at remembering these kind of foods that I had with them over there. Hey, Bruno, another one real quick, another question. Um, yeah. And also a note that we've got about 15 minutes left here, so I don't know where you are in the slides, but yeah. uh, a question here is, can you order what might be safe insects as eggs 
in order to raise them um, or in some stage to raise? And is there a program that teaches a person how to raise them? Is there some sort of resource out there somebody could get to uh, learn yes. how to raise their crickets well, and get sure. a safe pesticide free source of the? Y yes, the yes. If you, if, you, if you do a search online, you, you can find now uh, some reputable companies in the United States. If you live in the upper Midwest, for example, I found lately a young lady from Northern Iowa, and that stuck with me because it's not too far from Southeastern Minnesota where I live. She has a beautiful uh, website. She sells uh, mainly mealworms. So yes, online, check online, do a search because there are hobbyists Small scale, very small scale. I'm talking about hobbyist uh, mealworm and cricket uh, growers that, uh, like you see in the slide, in that kind of scale, they can take care of their insects. Normally, if you make a purchase, you will get what I would call an inoculum. In your packet, probably you will get mainly adults. So males and females that once you have established in your drawer or your little system with the substrate that they require, et cetera, you will uh, be able to start to enable them to start their cycle and reproduce. I also would suggest to do a search on YouTube because on YouTube you find very different kind of, uh, of uh, information, but they're very visual, people who have done it, people who have made mistakes, and so they are very generous in sharing their experiences. So like I said, a very small space, like this could be a, an unused room in an apartment, this could be a basement. I would say in general, the main requirement for these insects to be happy is a steady temperature. So for mealworms, we are talking about a steady temperature in the high 60s, 70s. Crickets, the species Akira, which is the most common, you know, uh, will do very well in a temperature that is uh, in the high 80s or low 90s. That's why normally in the box or container where you raise these crickets, there is always an infrared lamp. I remember this from... Uh, from school, from the biology department where we raised these. So this kind of idea of raising insects has to do, you know, with the conception, I would say, of permaculture. So the city becomes a multifunctional landscape. And so if you do not even have the opportunity of an open space outdoors, or if you live like in, 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 in a northern state, like I can imagine Minnesota right now, where it's very cold and everything is covered with ice and sub-zero temperatures, then uh, I think uh, raising uh, invertebrates is, is, can be entertaining, can be uh, educational, and also if you, are, if you have imprenditorial skills, uh, can become also profitable. Um, I think that in the United States, the, ma the major market niche is primarily to grow mealworms and crickets as food for pets. But for example, if you are a passionate uh, urban gardener and you have uh, chickens in your backyard, oh, they would go nuts if you feed them on a regular basis live insects or live uh, larvae. So, multiple opportunities I would see for, for this kind of activities in the city. So permaculture, I don't know how well versed you are with permaculture, but there are certain values and certain principles. Uh, you, you have biological productions that may be exceeding, and so you share them, and you develop also pleasing landscapes that are biologically diverse besides being biologically productive. So that is all concerned with the design process, okay? Now, micro farms in the urban, uh, in the urban scape, okay? Uh, in the developing world, world, like I said, they're not simply famine food. They have been for a very long time a viable opportunity for income for millions of people besides ensuring their food security. 
And so these potentially could become available also in our big cities, help people who are landless or do not have any other chance, you know, to grow uh, food. Well, this could be done. And so economic development, uh, starting really with very limited investments, I'm talking about here, if you establish uh, that three or four plastic drawer system that you can purchase at Target or Walmart for maybe $10, maybe add another $10, $15 to purchase your pound or two pounds of live, uh, of live uh, beetles and, and you are in business, okay? However, what are the quid pro quo? The quid pro quo again are the cultural idea that consuming insects in Western culture is dirty, is primeval, is uh, unacceptable. When in reality, you know, we may be consuming insects whether we want it or not, because that tenebrio molitor, you know, that, that I, I, was, I was mentioning, the mealworm, is basically what you may find occasionally, even without noticing it, the larva in your cereals. Okay, in your grains, your oatmeal, you go to the food store and you buy organic oatmeal, you know, in bulk quantity. That's a possibility. There is nothing wrong with it. I would say Akuna Matata. Remember the Disney movie, The Lion King? It just tastes good. It's good protein for you. So go for it. However, we need to develop a marketing strategy and that is what entrepreneurs are out there ready because the few products that are available on the market right now are like uh, niche markets and uh, and the cost for producing uh, at that level niche markets that derive from insects is quite expensive and so when it shouldn't be because like i've been trying to persuade you there are all these environmental benefits in raising insects. So the cost of production should be minimal. Another big void is the law, policy and legislation. You don't want to get into a business and then the first time you have a, an inspection from the public health office or, or, or maybe the city that has to allow you to open this new business, there is opposition because the, again, there are not even laws or provisions to regulate the growth of insects, especially if you want to market them for human consumption, okay? So here very quickly, you know, I'm proposing three species that are very easy to grow. I have already mentioned the mealworm, okay? I have already mentioned the cricket. On the left hand side, the silkworm. Now the silkworm would be double purpose. You could eat it, but even more, uh, uh, the silk from the cocoon where the larva uh, develops into a pupa has, has marketable value. Now, silkworm uh, has been superseded when the chemical industry developed nylon and other uh, non-natural fiber, fi fabrics. But if you go again to Asia, India, China, Uzbekistan, you know, all the Stan countries, Kazakhstan, etc., there is a microeconomy that is thriving over there. And then, of course, our honeybees. You get food, you get medicine, propolis, which is the resin the bees bring back to the hive to close every single crack, you know. Scientists at the U of M, my friend Marla Spivak and her students, you know, they, they, they have learned that propolis is not only antifungal and antibactericidal, but even antiviral. So it's a great medicine, okay? Venom, the venom from the honeybee. Did you know that medical doctors in the US have been using and still do some bee puncture to treat people from rheumatoid arthritis? And then of course, nowadays everybody knows about uh, the $20 billion uh, market provided by pollination, especially to the fruit and vegetable industry in the United States and wax as well. Okay, so wax for candle, for foundation sheets, for, for, for beekeeping, okay, lip balm, lotion, body butter, and, and, and the list goes on, okay? So, uh, sericulture, the growth of the silkworm, 
requires the availability of mulberry. I know that mulberry grows, at least in southern Minnesota, but I don't know if you live in Bemidji, if there is mulberry up there, probably not. So I would not suggest then the silkworm. Also because, as you see from the picture, it may require a little bit more space, okay? The silkworm is growing on these huge planes, like shelves of a big wide uh, bookcase with light for the temperature. And every day you have to add quite a number of pounds of foliage of uh, mulberry, fresh mulberry, because that is what the larva will eat throughout its cycle, okay? But the mealworm instead is much easier. The mealworm will be raised on oatmeal, and then you give him a, a carrot just as a source of water that will be changed on a, every couple of days. So moisture, uh, all the water they can get is pretty much from the fresh vegetable that you can add, a potato, half a potato, something like that, okay? Same for the crickets. So Akira domesticus, this is the typical cricket, you know, that is raised also in departments of biology as, like I said, food for vertebrates, pets, like iguanas, geckos, etc. Uh, here you can see the cricket, I can tell you, is a female because that needle protruding from the posterior part of the body is the ovipositor. So a female that has been breeding will lay a few hundred eggs every day when it is uh, mature. But as you can read from the slide, the temperature here is a major requirement for the crickets to be active, to be healthy, and complete their cycles without impediment. So a basement where that is non-heated, if the temperature cannot be maintained at those levels, I would say uh, don't do that. Uh, but the mealworms, the mealworms are much more adaptable, okay? In this slide, that's a picture from my little backyard. I'm, I'm, I'm raising chickens on the side. And so uh, I have not been raising um, any of these uh, in crickets or, or mealworms uh, myself at home. I'm raising uh, um, earthworms instead, okay? I'm feeding my chickens, for example, Japanese beetles, which is a bad invasive that destroys people's gardens in the summer. But uh, definitely, when you offer those kind of live critters, the birds are very healthy, very happy. But also other, other small mammals that can be raised in the city, like rabbits or maybe fish, like tilapia in an, in an aquaponic system, would benefit from it as well. What can I tell you, you know, to conclude? Uh, I would say, if you want to get into insect raising, first of all, start small. And secondly, I would say, try to educate yourself to learn as much as possible about the biology of the species that you're going to grow. Because only by learning all the, the, the information required about their biology, you will apply that information and you will be sure to make your insects healthy, and reproductively capable, and you will be successful in your effort, okay? Again, if you have, if you have uh, birds, domestic birds, I'm talking about ducks, I'm talking about quails, chickens, you name it, they will feast, okay? Birds are insectivorous by nature, okay? Even the birds that come on your feeder because you offer them grain, well, if they don't have anything else, <laughs> I understand. But if you have plants like native plants from the prairie, they will attract the bugs and the birds coming to your house will be much happier because nutritionally they get much more protein and minerals and fats than what they can get from dehydrated grains as you can buy at the store, okay? Edible insects grown under controlled conditions are not expected hazard when compared to the growth of traditional animal species. However, scientists are indicating that more research, especially for, uh, for all things concerned with allergies is necessary, okay? So on this token, you know, food safety research and policy should be focusing in addressing the food chain, taking into account species features, insect origins, farm management, 
and environmental conditions. These are few um, uh, references that I thought could be valuable to you. In particular, the second one, which is a book, Edible Insects. I don't know if you can see my arrow pointer here. There is a 2013 production by the FAO. Very, very informative, but also all the others are very, are very good. The first one, Beluco, is a group of nutritionists, Italian nutritionists and veterinarians. So this uh, type of article is more about the, the uh, public health type of issues. So with this, I don't know if there are any questions, but I believe we are almost at time. I thank you for your attention. And Thanks, Bruno. Yeah, I think we are at time, but there are a couple of questions here. Uh, maybe I can answer, ask them together and uh, you can respond. One of them, I think you covered a little bit after it was asked, but is there a market for insects in Minnesota currently? And then the next question after that is, uh, people have ax asked at farmer's market to buy bee larvae to eat. How would that be prepared to bring to market live or refrigerated or sometimes remove extra drone cells when they are in the wrong parts of the hive? Mm. Um, and then okay. a final comment. Thank you very much. It's been very interesting. Uh, you are teaching in my hometown of Winona. It's a play, uh, piece of heaven on earth. But anyway, so that's a great little <laughs> comment. But if you have any response to those questions, Sure. Uh, in terms of in terms of market, I'm not aware of any. Of course, all the action in Minnesota happens in the Twin Cities. So, <laughs> the Twin Cities for me is like the Florence of the Renaissance. So, so I wouldn't be surprised if maybe in a health food store uh, you can maybe venture and find out that maybe there are snack bars that are maybe offered with. Uh, with crickets uh, components, but uh, I'm not aware of anything uh, uh, per se. Everything, in my opinion, I think uh, must be developed. In terms of producing the insects and bringing them to market, well, uh, I could tell you, do like they have done for thousands of years in uh, developing countries. Bring them there already dead, so that could be sauteed maybe in, uh, in oil, okay? Or if you want to sell them alive, definitely bringing them, bringing them there in a, in a nice chest after exposing them to cold temperature will make them more dormant. In other words, they will not escape or, <laughs> or jump out, okay? <laughs> but again, uh, I would say that all these techniques, eventually, every single grower, depending also the distance from the market, you know, one thing is if you are downstairs or around the corner or where you're growing or if you're driving a couple of hours. But ice would work well also for storing both pre-cooked or uh, still live insects that will go dormant if the temperature goes below 32 Fahrenheit. Um, great, thanks. Uh, one more thing, Bruno, if you can um, stop sharing your screen and I can share my screen and I can finish up with the final slides, unless anybody else has any quick last questions you want to scribble into your chat box there. Um, until then, I will, let's see, share, 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 share. All righty. Okay, so I think you can see my screen now here. Um, things to do, please, please, please fill out the evaluation that will be emailed to you. Um, you can check us out on Facebook at this link here, facebook.com slash groups slash local foods college slash backslash, I guess. Um, you can tweet at, uh, what's that, hashtag local foods college or at RSDP at UMN small farms. And then also please join us next week. Next week, we will have our Upper Midwest Hazelnut Session with Jason Fishbach. Hazelnuts are a perennial woolly crop that are native to the Upper Midwest. Significant progress has been made in recent years toward developing a viable hazelnut variety in the upper blah, blah, blah. So the hazelnuts are great. They're a new up-and-coming crop. Come listen to Jason Fishbach. He knows more about this stuff than almost anybody. 
Um, and finally, thank you very much, z.umn.edu backslash local foods college for more information. And with that, um, I shall send you all home. Thank <laughs> you.